Thank you for streaming Cities After, a radical exploration into the capitalist contradictions of our urban world and the many anti-capitalist futures to come. This is a Democracy at Work broadcast, and I'm your host, Miguel Robles Duran. For the first episode of season three, I present a personal account of my life in Tijuana, Mexico, to illustrate why our cities are central to understanding how capitalism materializes into our daily lives, but also to explain how we can practice the reading of urbanization as the living text of inequality. My hope is that after you finish streaming this episode, your curiosity gets aroused to exercise the deciphering of the capitalist and anti-capitalist code that is constantly being written in our cities and persistently programming a myriad of possible futures. After 33 episodes spanning two years, season three of Cities After is now being produced for video and podcast formats simultaneously. An important reason for this transition is to make each episode more interactive by allowing all of us to participate in discussions posted in the comments below of the YouTube stream. If you commonly follow the podcasts, I invite you to once in a while come to our YouTube channel, post comments, and try subverting Google's algorithm by subscribing and giving us a thumbs up. I really look forward to interacting with everyone. With that said, I want to start the first video broadcast by thanking all of you for the support, warm wishes, and constructive critiques over the last two years. Cities After was conceived as a radical exploration into the capitalist makings of our urban world and the consequences of its oppressive prescriptions into our daily lives. My drive since episode one has been to attempt a deep materialist critique of urban dynamics, always with the hope that these critiques and explorations are able to influence our continuous anti-capitalist struggles, but most importantly, entice an active imagination for the possibility of a better urban world today and after capitalism. Once again, thank you. And now to the topic of the episode. My recollections of living in Mexico City as a child in the late 1970s and early 1980s are very vivid, especially those that refer to the economic hardships and political instability brought by decades of party dictatorship and American subjugation. But no memory is as haunting as the time when I heard from my parents and later by the state-controlled television, that all banks were being nationalized following months of extreme devaluation of the Mexican peso vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar. The date was September 1, 1982. And by then, the peso had lost almost 50% of its value. Even though I was seven years old, I can't forget the facial expressions of horror and angst in every adult I met the weeks and months after. That year, Mexico had the world's largest external debt, consuming over 49% of its GDP. Consequently, its economy underwent a chain of catastrophic events that culminated with the grim announcement that it was no longer able to service its external debt. By December, Mexico had been coerced by the US, the International Monetary Fund, or IMF, and other international lenders to undertake a harsh structural adjustment modeled on the economic pilots that General Augusto Pinochet in Chile had been implementing since 1975. And this one he announced full reliance on the advice of the infamous Chicago Boys and their extreme theories of economic liberalization better known as neoliberalism. 
The violent structural adjustment that Mexico was coerced into followed all the classical forms of neoliberal terrorism. First, it implemented a supranationally policed fiscal austerity program with a very strict monetary policy that gave them control over the Mexican peso and its valuation. Second, they forced the selling of public land and most state-owned enterprises to private stakeholders. American capitalists loved this one, and some Mexican billionaires, such as Carlos Slim, were made thanks to this. Third, they obliged the lessening or elimination of trade restrictions, mostly on imports from the United States. Fourth, they pushed for the implementation of a sweeping program of industrial deregulation. This is the weakening of government power over major industries. This was meant to create a favorable climate for foreign companies to settle in Mexico as industry competitors. Fifth, they prompted the building of a new legal apparatus that would help open up most economic sectors to foreign direct investment. And last but not least, they bullied and corrupted Mexican authorities into the signing of more billions of debt to the IMF and other supranational organizations for future generations to pay. I like to say that Chile was the first neoliberal experiment, but Mexico was the first neoliberal state. Obviously, as a child, I could not make sense of anything that was going on. All I was absorbing from my surroundings was a general state of panic, total anxiety and dread. Now that I'm talking about it, I actually doubt most adults understood the gravity of the cataclysmic shifts to come. Everything that was happening with debt negotiations was deemed too abstract as something that only PhDs in economics would be able to understand. So from what I remember, all the blame was falling towards the corrupt politicians, which certainly had a lot to do with it, but hardly anyone was mentioning the role that the USA, the IMF, the World Bank, and all the likes had in producing the crisis. As a matter of fact, the general consensus was that the Americans were going to be the saviors and protectors of what was left of the Mexican economy. The Americans will help fix everything, almost begging to bring on the fast food chains. Little I knew that the coming decade would force me to experience the extreme material violence of capitalism and its intricate links to urbanization. 1993 brought a rapid deterioration of the quality of life in Mexico City. There was a dramatic rise in overall criminal activity, from petty robberies to kidnappings to organized mafias. And this crime was being fed by a rampant corruption at all levels of the government, public servants and institutions, by widespread bankruptcies, by overarching austerity measures, by a high rate of unemployment and the steadfast crumbling of basic urban infrastructures. Witnessing this absolute social decay and having been the victim of two armed robberies in a matter of months, my father, because yes, I'm sad to say that patriarchy was strong in my family, decided that moving our household closer to the Americans would bring better opportunities to serve the crisis and provide preferable living conditions for my mother, my younger sister, and me. And like tens of thousands of other families that thought the same, we migrated to where at the time was deemed the most prosperous city in Mexico, Tijuana, right at the border to San Diego, California, the city that at the time held the title of being America's finest. Yes, Tijuana. It's hard to believe that a city that is now synonymous with drug cartels, extreme violence, slums, and maquiladoras was once seen as a golden territory that provided an opportunity to escape 
the socioeconomic turmoil that engulfed most of Mexico and be able to prosper without too many afflictions. I arrived to Tijuana in the summer of 1983. And as far as I remember, the city had a slow and provincial atmosphere. I definitely would not call it pretty, but in contrast to the chaos and pollution that had taken over Mexico City, it felt like I was in some kind of new but badly planned suburbia with empty avenues, unbuilt roads, vast vacant plots, and no detectable business center. But instead, its territory was threaded by a dispersed array of small commercial pockets that were clearly segregated in function to the social class of its surrounding inhabitants. Due to Tijuana's hilly topography, it was easy to see that most of the city inhabitants consisted of working poor population. The majority of the houses were made of substandard materials. The cars that almost everyone drove were old and falling apart, as if they had been supplied by junkyards, which in fact they were. And besides the few somehow wealthy neighborhoods, basic urban infrastructure was lacking. Water was supplied with rusty tanker trucks. Sewage was either managed via makeshift septic tanks or channeled into the streets. The electricity grid was dangerous and did not reach all the population. Gas was distributed by tanks and the majority of secondary roads were unpaved. All of this was a stark contrast to how I had experienced Mexico City which despite its many dysfunctional elements, it had never felt to me as an underdeveloped city. In hindsight, I now understand that one of the reasons for the inferior urban conditions of Tijuana was the centralized development dogmas that Mexico had abided to since colonial times. But of course, another important reason was its physical closeness to the United States. One gets to experience the brutality of imperial power, the closer one gets to its outer borders. Without doubt, the most haunting visual aspect of Tijuana was the monolithic presence of the seemingly infinite and patrolled linear marker that divided the land in two completely different territories. Despite them sharing the same climate, the same air, the same light and shadows, the same soil, flora, and fauna. The now infamous border wall wasn't there yet. What was there instead were segments of chain link fence, but the division and separation was unmistakable. The other side looked ordered, clean, and lushly landscaped. My side was chaotic, dirty, dry, and full of dust. I could see the Interstate Freeway number five with its wide concrete lanes occupied by shiny new cars as it funneled south into Tijuana's meager two lanes of badly paved road, usually disrupted by informal sellers, beggars, and stray dogs. This was the first time that I remember being fully conscious of my socioeconomic precondition as a Mexican and the multitude of disparities that this prescribed on my existence. Still today, I find it impossible to assess the impact that observing Tijuana in this critical light had on my childhood development. But I am certain that living my teenage years in this borderland taught me something that no university ever educated me on. And that is how to read urbanization as the living text of inequality. Years before I started reading Marx. In 1983 and 1984, despite its underdeveloped condition, Tijuana did not seem as economically deteriorated nor consumed by criminal activity as Mexico City was. My father must have thought he had made the right decision by moving us there. I also remembered that American cultural influence was way stronger 
than the Mexican. I could freely watch TV channels from San Diego, including MTV. I could also listen to all the pop rock music that had been softly banned for decades in Mexican radio stations. And the people around me wore Nike or Reebok shoes, San Diego Chargers jerseys, and San Diego Padres baseball caps. Stores and supermarkets carried all kinds of American goods. And due to a special border status, Tijuana's local economy utilized the US dollar as a main currency. People were still poor, but the impact of the peso devaluation was felt much less in the streets. Also, if you were privileged to have a border crossing permit, you could be eating in a McDonald's or at the cinema watching a newly released Hollywood blockbuster in a matter of minutes. Disneyland was just two hours drive, and the aspirational dreamlands of the Hollywood Hills mansions, which my mother loved, were within reach of another 30 minutes drive north. But no matter how deep I was enveloped in the illusions of Ronald Reagan's America, I was always waking up at the sight of the unfortunate Mexican reality. Albeit in the twilight zone of the border condition. But by 1985, Tijuana started to be severely affected by the ongoing Mexican crisis and the widespread transformations that the neoliberal rescue packages strained in the nation's economy. These effects were clearly materialized in the drastic reorganization of the territory and its new forms of social occupation, more precisely in its urbanization patterns. And these social spatial shakeouts dramatically intensified after the deadliest earthquake in Mexico's modern history stroke in September of that year. The event not only caused widespread panic in the population of the greater metropolitan areas of Mexico, prompting a mass exodus to other cities. Tijuana was a preferred one, and so was Ciudad Juarez. This was due to their dollarized economy and border status. But the economic damage, estimated at over 5 billion US dollars of the time, had to be integrated into additional economic rescue packages that came with international aid, pulling the country deeper into its unescapable spiral of foreign debt and social unrest. From 1985 to the early 1990s, Tijuana was transformed into the city that is now internationally famous for. The city consumed by drug cartels, extreme violence, poverty, slums, and maquiladoras. In less than 10 years, it became unrecognizable to the once prosperous city that my father thought it had moved to. I spent much of my teenage years trying to make sense as to what could have prompted such an abrupt shift. I could see the city precipitously changing for the worst every single day and how my friends and people around me were also becoming something else. And I did not like it. Tijuana was getting uglier and dirtier. Slums were appearing out of nowhere. Thousands of poor migrants from the south of Mexico arrived daily. General crime was rising, and the violent presence of drug cartels started to be noticed more and more. The rudimental urban infrastructure of Tijuana had no possibility of coping with such demands. The limited paved roads were full of potholes. The electricity grid was constantly faulting. Water and sewage services could not reach the new inhabitants of the recently formed slums. And the old formal dwellings were not being serviced adequately. The sight of so much urban havoc was difficult to process especially when it was contrasted with the new shiny glass towers that started to be built around the Zona Rio, an area labeled as Tijuana's new financial and business district, and Club Campestre, which was Tijuana's only golf course located at the center of the wealthiest neighborhoods. If this contrast wasn't enough to paralyze, now imagine the schizophrenic shock that I experienced about 
twice a week when I was visiting San Diego, the southern crown of Ronald Reagan's pride and joy state of California, America's richest. Needless to say, everything there, including its population, looked superiorly developed, wealthy, prosperous, orderly, and safe. My life, like the one of many other inhabitants of the poor side, on that side of the border, was constantly switching between paradoxical landscapes. After all, I was inhabiting a unique extreme contradiction in which all the abstract neoliberal economic policies were fully materialized in space. In Tijuana, you did not need a PhD in economics to understand all of these abstractions. All you needed to do was open your eyes to the urban dynamics at play, to comprehend far deeper than with books the implications of neoliberal capitalism and its social, economic, environmental, and political consequences. Now that I have read through most of Marx, I still find two short paragraphs in chapter 25 of Capital Volume 1 to speak to me the most from his vast body of work. This is what he wrote. I open quote. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is therefore at the same time accumulation of misery, agony of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation at the opposite pole, i.e. on the side of the class that produces its own product in the form of capital. I end quote. Then a few paragraphs further, he wrote, I open quote, the intimate connection between the pangs of hunger of the most industrious layers of the working class and the extravagant consumption, coarse or refined, of the rich for which capitalist accumulation is the basis, reveals itself only when the economic laws are known. It is otherwise with the housing of the poor. Every unprejudiced observer sees that the greater decentralization of the means of production the greater is the corresponding heaping together of the laborers within a given space. That, therefore, the swifter capitalist accumulation, the more miserable are the dwellings of the working people. I end quote. I confess that I got chills the first time I read this. I must have been around 25 years old. And these two quotes fully resonated with my life as an unprejudiced observer in Tijuana. It was when I thoroughly comprehended what Marx meant when he wrote, it is otherwise with the housing of the poor, that I realized that cities were the material mirror of capitalism, that urbanization was the living text of inequality, and that I could understand and predict capitalist dynamics by learning how to read this text, meticulously observing how macroeconomic abstractions had a clear and tangible physical representation in the spaces I inhabited. Cities as dynamic spatial constructions are the key to visualizing and fully comprehending capitalism's life-sucking and self-destructive complexities. Hence, the production of clear and tangible physical ruptures and frictions to capitalist manifestations in cities can, in reverse, turn into macroeconomic abstractions and ultimately be the key to visualizing the material space of the anti-capitalist revolution to come, the urban revolution. After deciphering this, Tijuana was no longer the ugly, poor, violent, and unfortunate city by the American border. Tijuana was the material text of decades of American imperial impositions, of vicious neoliberal treaties, of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, of labor flexibilization, of industrial deregulation policies, of unfettered foreign direct investment and of the pernicious privatization of natural resources, public infrastructures, and land. 
in short, it was for me the ultimate 4D visualization of capital. Okay, let me illustrate further what I mean by the 4D visualization. With this newly learned dialectical lens, I could read that the abrupt appearance of slums was the result of mass migration. On one side, triggered by the economic crisis, but on the other, provoked by the privatization of rural lands and the foreign-backed technological investments in agriculture that left thousands of farmers without a means of subsistence. Inner cities had high levels of unemployment, and the new job sources were in the maquiladoras that were stationed in the newly designated tax-free zones of border cities like Tijuana, where American companies could outsource manufacturing jobs to a place they didn't have to comply with strict labor, zoning, and environmental regulations, where building was cheap, where they didn't have to pay living wages or employment benefits, where workers were vast and disposable, where they didn't have to worry about high insurance premiums, and where they didn't have to pay taxes. In short, where they could expand their production output for pennies on the dollar and make more profit. Most of the slums that appeared when I was living in Tijuana surrounded these fenced off, police protected, tax free manufacturing zones rife with ma maquiladoras. Workers from all pueblos in Mexico migrated in waves with no money and no means of transportation, looking for a piece of land to settle where they could walk to their new American owned spaces of exploitation. The slums hit this text, and through this dialectical and anti-capitalist lens, I could read through the injustices that produced them. In many ways, the text was a postmodern version of what Engels described in his 1845 book, The Condition of the Working Class in England. Over time, I learned to read every spatial and material text I could find in the urbanization of Tijuana. And as you can imagine, it immediately became inevitable to expand to new territories and interpret the texts of other urban regions across the world. For this, I want to stress that if capitalism operates at a planetary scale, Urbanization has to be read as a planetary phenomenon that is produced when capital tries to materialize its abstractions, when it places them in our material world. And although it may sound contradictory, the scale of urbanization is not the scale defined by the political or physical boundaries of cities. Under capitalism, urbanization is a borderless process that produces variations of expropriated and exploited population, concentrated at the service of surplus accumulation. And these concentrations are what we call cities. I have put in practice the lessons that Tijuana taught me in every city I have lived, worked or visited. When I was living in Rotterdam and Zurich, I could only find blurred text of inequality in the small pockets of the city where migrant workers and refugees from the global south concentrated. And this is the experience most inhabitants and visitors have of these very wealthy cities. Hell, I was once told by a Dutch professor that there was no poverty in the Netherlands. Imagine that. The majority of the people I've known that had the opportunity to travel to Western Europe. Tell me how impressed they are about everything being so beautiful, perfect, pristine, and functional. The public parks are meticulously kept. The roads are smooth without a trace of potholes. The pedestrian streets and sidewalks are clean, well illuminated. They have amazing public transportation, etc., etc. 
And I'm often asked two questions. New Yorkers ask, Miguel, why the hell did you leave Europe for the chaos of New York City? And friends from the global south ask, why is it that our cities can never look like that? My dark answer to them is that these cities materialize a 500-year accumulation of the wealth that they have plundered from expropriating and exploiting natural resources and people in other territories, where their capitalist class have constantly destroyed, polluted, and murdered to get their cities to look like that. But to not end the conversation with such dark and depressing answer, I encourage them, as I am encouraging you, to practice reading your city as a container of dynamic accumulations of wealth and impoverishment, of construction and destruction. The urbanization of your city is the representation of a borderless process that has given physical form to the vicious expropriations and exploitations that capitalists have executed successfully for centuries. Next time you are in the streets, exercise reading your city beyond its visual appearance and past its physical and political limits. Once you do that, I'm certain that it will help you expand your understanding of capitalism as to how it materially reproduces in the urban world we all inhabit, providing transformative insights on how to radicalize our living environments.